What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Run With Toby podcast. I'm Jared. We are on episode 27. 27 is kind of a cool podcast. Uh, we dive into the world of UX and UI with Aaron Emre. Um, he sits down and tells us about his experience working in Silicon Valley. Um, he also tells us about the importance and the psychology thinking behind UX and UI design which is something that kind of gets overlooked quite a bit um, when people are either designing an app, a product, or a website. So he goes into some pretty good details about why it's really important to think about the psychology behind all of um, the process in that. He also talks about his new company that he just founded called Food People, and he tells us about why and how he's used some of his past uh, experiences with UX and UI in his new endeavor. Um, It's a really cool episode. He's a really interesting guy. He's also, uh, side note, he's also a really, really good photographer, but he doesn't really like to brag about it. Um, We'll definitely link some of his... uh, his pictures in in the show notes. Um, But we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. There's a ton of good information in it. If you've ever wondered about what UX and UI is all about, this is definitely that episode to dive into. As always, guys, don't forget to rate, subscribe, and tell a friend about the Run With Toby podcast. We'd really love to hear your feedback, and we hope you enjoy this episode. All right, what's going on, Andrew? Not much, man. I always... I always try to think of something clever to say when you say that. I do, too. I always say, not much, man. I always (laughs) say... I always try not to say what's going on, Andrew, but I always end up saying what's going on, Andrew. <laughs> Guess creatures of habit. Uh, it's good, man. You know, uh, another week. Another, another week, another podcast. Yeah, another week, another podcast. Definitely yep. been on the grind, you know, lately. But uh, but yeah, things are good. Um, we're back-to-back episodes again. So yep. looking yep, forward back to in the it. swing of things. Uh, we are on episode 27, like I said. Have a special guest, which is awesome. Um, we're going to talk about some techie stuff today, which we usually don't get too deep into. So I'm kind of excited. Yeah. And, um, some things that I think apply to a lot of folks who have anything web facing that a lot of folks probably don't understand. Let's just say, I guess like software facing, Yeah, no matter what what it applies. Software. Yeah. Right. Exactly. True. True. So any of you SaaS people out there, uh, shout out to you guys. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into the episode. So today we have a very special guest. We have Iran. What's up, guys? What's up? I was going to do the applause, but it, it was only one one person clapping. But uh, thanks for being on. Thanks for joining us, taking some time out of your super busy schedule. It's great to be here. So we focus on three or four topics throughout the podcast from the first podcast till even now. Um, and a lot have to do with uh, one of the themes is entrepreneurship. Um, some of the other themes are like a lot of obviously marketing since we're a marketing agency uh, we do some creative and you kind of straddle across a yeah. lot of these um you yourself are now an entrepreneur taking taking the leap of faith as they like to say which is awesome but uh so that's half the reason why we asked you to come on the other half is you are an experienced ux and ui designer Correct. Um, which is what andrew was kind of leading to there for a second um yeah so what i want to talk to you about is um kind of dive into UX, UI, but I also want to talk to you about your recent uh, endeavor in entrepreneurship. Oh, wait, we can't forget. Awesome photographer and just yeah. artist overall, right? So we, <laughs> I was actually going to say, we talk about um, marketing, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about design and creative, and you definitely straddle all of those. Yeah. So you're, we're actually looking forward to this. So I feel like if, if we were to visualize this, we'd put him on like a torture chamber where we're like stretching <laughs> in like every direction. Marketing. Yeah. <laughs> right. or, or all of you, all of you, uh, pre millennials, like, do you remember that scene in Kickboxer where they're like stretching oh, yeah. Van Damme <laughs> yeah. out before he's like going to fight? I think it's Kickboxer, Bloodsport, one of those. Apparently he couldn't just do the splits and the yeah. legs. He could do it in the arms and the yeah, shoulders yeah. too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, why don't you go ahead and give yourself or uh, give our audience your backstory and kind of like how you arrived into today? Sure. Um, well, I'm from Turkey. Uh, I spent 25 years of my life in Turkey and moved to the States in 2008. So it's it's been 10 years actually this month. Oh, uh, nice. Right. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Uh, so <clears throat> I I was lucky enough to have a computer early age in my home. So I got into it around the age of eight and I I was very impressed so I was very very curious about it so I just started learning everything about computers 
And a lot of things are self-taught because you don't have books back then. And no internet. Turkey, no and YouTube. It's English, no YouTube, no internet, nothing. So I was just like bashing commands on like <laughs> MS-DOS. I uh, played video games. I got bored. There was nothing to do. So I was like putting the pieces apart of the computer and I'm putting that back, formatting my computer and all those things. Luckily, the internet came and I basically just lost myself and spent hours on the internet learning how to make websites, learning how to use new tools and all those things. I started teaching myself how to do coding so I can build a website for myself. Um, this is like before GeoCities and stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I, uh, it, it was 2000 and blogger was there. Blogging was something very huge. So I started writing about web technologies, cyber cultures, design and all those things that helped me learn more about my craft, uh, which became design after working as a designer, uh, as a coder at a web agency in Turkey for about four years. So, so that was your first like job my first job was actually i was selling flowers okay <laughs> okay and i Shout sold out Petal Fox. Uh, yeah. like candies on the street on yeah. holidays and stuff uh but my first official official job was uh, a designer at a print company so we were making business cards brochures and all those things how do you um do you feel like you sort of have in a natural design background did you how did you self? I, did you self teach yourself? Did you have a mentor? It's or? all self taught. Huh. I I think it's mostly the curiosity, because I like I said I was obsessed with computers. I wanted to learn everything about it. Everything I can do on a computer, I wanted to see how can I do it. Um, I even tried like DJing a little bit. Uh, oh, really? I was, right. I was really really bad at it. So That's, I I focused on more the visual stuff. Cool. Yeah. We That's don't need the, more uh, DJs. The underlying backstory of the podcast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Seriously, some 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 interaction with the DJs. Right, uh, right. What brought you over to the states? Um, it was kind of random. I met a girl in Turkey. We fall in love, and she a girl. she's like half American, half Turkish, and she wanted to study study in the states. So I came along. The plan was I was going to stay with her a little bit, and then came, go back. But I ended up staying, and we broke up, and then she went back. <laughs> and I'm here. Yeah. That's, so it worked out for the better. Huh. Yeah. I'm and what'd you, what'd you do when you first got out here? Were you still in so, like web design? Or? Uh, before coming here, I was basically doing web development. I was yep. leading a team of uh, five people in Turkey. Uh, but I always had interest. And like we br- kind of, we, with my blog, we kind of brought like a CSS coding and all those things to Turkey because everybody was still using like tables, spacer gifts right, and all those right. things. So um, after that, I felt like I've done a lot when it comes to coding. I wanted something different. So when I moved to the States, I just focused on design. So I started working with startup. Nice. Did you, um, so you had no, did you go to college or have any traditional? I, I went to a two-year college. I studied statistics and marketing. And it's like old fashioned marketing, so I don't remember any of those things. But yep. that was just to get a degree. Right, right. Yeah. Nice. Um let me let me ask. Yeah. I have a I got a question that I think a lot of people I think intermingle or mix up a lot, which is in your opinion or from your perspective, what is the difference between design and development? Um huh. It's design to me, if I want to compare it to making a car, design is on paper. You prototype it and all those things, but development is basically making it actual, actually work. Like I can prototype a car, for example, I can move it with my hands, but in order to make it work so other people can use it, you need an engineer to just put plug things together and the, and this it's a pretty obviously elementary question for people in the field but the reason i ask this is because there's a lot of people out there our clients potential clients whoever who don't really understand that marriage mm-hmm, between mm-hmm. design and development mm-hmm. right whether you're making shoes or a website or a car for exactly. that matter right mm-hmm. and so as someone who kind of under seems like you understand both both sides of mm-hmm. it pretty well. Yeah. Um, like, how important is it in your in your opinion to 
get those two things to kind of mesh together? And how do you get them to mesh together? Mm -hmm. Well, technically, you can get away with just having an engineer coding the website or product for you, and it will be designed by the engineer, which you probably don't want to. Right. But just because <laughs> it's functional doesn't mean yeah. it's exactly. actually going to work. Exactly. So Frankenstein worked, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you want someone who is experienced in design, understands the mechanics, understands human psychology, understands your business, understands your goals, and... Uh, carves up a solution for you. You can do the same thing as a business owner. I'm on the other side of the uh, table right now, so I, I understand a lot of things more better. And I have distrust towards a, a, a third party, right? Because I feel like they don't understand my work, uh, my business. But designer's job is basically uh, take all the information, put it together, understand your uh, problem, and come up with a solution and take that solution to the engineer where they can look at the technical aspects of it and make it actual actual product. Yeah. I feel like and I don't know maybe maybe this is because I I I feel like you I I feel like I fairly understand both sides pretty well. Um I feel like the design part if you don't understand it um like we were saying like just because it's functional doesn't mean it's going to work. But I feel like a designer can morph easier into a developer rather than the other way around. Like if you're a developer, I think it's harder to figure out the design aspect mm -hmm. where if you're a designer, I think it's a little it's a, because development at some point just becomes one and zero. Right. It's it's black. It's white. It's this or that. Uh, it's logical when you're a developer. So I think as a designer, you can go into the other side a lot easier than going mm -hmm. back the other way. I don't know. Does that make sense? It it makes sense. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I I started doing coding first. I was doing a little bit of graphic design, but it was I was just curious about both sides. So that's I transitioned from code to design professionally. So in my case, it just worked fine. Right. But I can understand like when you're focusing in one aspect of these two categories you kind of get lost in the details and you want to learn it more. You want to be an expert. So you don't use the muscles that needs creativity to solve these problems like a designer does. Sure. You, you just work your other muscles. Like right. engineers are also designers too, but they solve problems with code, right? Right, right. Or, yeah, with logic. I guess with logic. Right. Mm -hmm. Huh. No, it's, I mean, so the other, quite, I always like talking to designers, especially in, UI UX designers in this day and age, because when you think about marketing, you think about the content, where you're going to distribute that content, but more and more design becomes a really important part of marketing, right? Um, and it could be what I call like funnel, everything down, like what do your landing pages look like? How much do they have to scroll? Are you on a button? Are you putting a drop shadow behind it? And what does that do to your conversion rates, right? So in some of the design that you've worked with when it comes to like web development, like landing pages, websites, um, how much do you factor marketing conversion or marketing goals mm -hmm. into how you design? Right when you put a mock-up together or whatever the case is, I, I think as a designer, it's your responsibility n to know about these 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 things. Like, as a designer, you solve a problem. If if it's a landing page, your biggest goal there is to uh, convert people to sign up or whatever, right? So you have to have you have to understand the human psychology. You have to understand the copy on that page is affects the conversion the image you use on that page affects the conversion the button everything affects the commerce conversion so in that sense you are actually uh responsible for all of those things and you have to think like a marketing person when you're also when you're designing a website you have to think like a coder as well so you, right. you design something that's easy to implement so you can help them uh, along the way also you have to think about the business goals right you have to consider all of those things. I, I see designer as like a multidisciplinary role in a company. It's like a bridge between mul uh, multiple departments. Totally. Yeah. Right. So you get information from all the all the departments, put them together, and create a solution that satisfies every need. 
I think my biggest challenge in working with designers is exactly that. It's understanding all the different departments that go into that final product. Because I think, at least with the designers that I've worked with, they're much more on, I would say, creative. Yeah, it will. It's than, it's pretty picture first, right? Functionality and, second. Yeah, yeah. Like this looks happens, amazing, yeah. but it doesn't work right. on well, a landing page with a white background. <laughs> yeah. You know, like things like that. And so, yeah. I think it's. It's tough. Like you put a job description for a designer out there, and maybe this is why you get down specifically to a UI or a UX designer, mm-hmm. right? Definitely. Um, but I think it's the word designer gets thrown around yeah. a lot, right? I, I think I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, the psychology of you know obviously it's of the end user, whoever uh, is going to be utilizing the tool or the that um, piece of you know if, if it's software or even if it's just um graphic design right mm-hmm. because it that even even that comes down to a specific um like how to lead your eye down a page things like that do you like i know you didn't go to school for for ux and ui but now that it's a thing do you think are they teaching psychology as part of that uh in the schools you mean yeah i i think uh i believe so yeah 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 that's Definitely. part of the it's, curriculum it's, i think it's a huge part of it like Human psychology, why we do the things we do, why we buy that thing, not this thing. Right. What happens when you present them like diff- 10 different solutions? Uh, what colors packages, for example. people gravitate towards or how exactly, they react yeah. to a specific every, every color? Every little thing affects what we do. So it's not about like, oh, this I use red here and uh, white here. They match right. together. It's it's not it. Yeah. yeah. That's just visual design. It's, it's funny because when you were talking about... Um, working with designers and how they kind of just gravitate towards the the visual aspect or the creative aspect, a really funny scene in Silicon Valley <laughs> popped in my head when they have this guy who's like presenting this box. I don't know if you remember. Oh, the, the, um, the Huli, the Huli yeah. box. Well, it's before it was the Huli box. It was the pie yeah. pie box, but yeah. basically they're just like a box and he's like flipping through different backgrounds behind it and different music. And he's just like, uh, you know, just design me a box. So he brings it back it, it, and it's just a black box and they're like, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's the, that's the creative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just so funny. But yeah, I mean, you're right because there's, a, there's all this like extra, like, you know, black magic around creative, you know, right. creativity. Like you, you start thinking of like, movies or films yeah. or artists who are painting murals and things like that, you yeah. know, but well, Apple has a, you know, a pretty good hand in, in branding it. That's that true, way. actually. Know, like, yeah. Let's do these videos with like Johnny. Every, everyone has got an iPad as a designer now. Yeah. Or the, <laughs> you know, we designed the iPhone yeah. with three millimeter, but yeah, yeah. yeah those, those ads. Yeah. You can thank them for, for branding it that way. Um, yeah. All right. So what, what are some of the current trends that you're seeing? I mean, I know, I know you're kind of stepping out of, mm-hmm. um, out of that as like, I don't think you'll ever get away from it just from curiosity, Sam, yeah. right? You'll, you'll probably never give it up. But uh, but just taking a step back, have you seen any any trends in the last couple of years that are happening? Um, so nowadays, I think we are going towards ethical design, uh, things happening with Facebook and all those things. Like oh, right. Designers have this power in, in their hands and sometimes they, they are not aware of. Like You can make someone do the exact thing you want them to do. You can uh, design their psychology They're around this, right? <laughs> so fa- basically companies like big companies like Facebook, they figured out these kind of triggers. That's why their products are so effective. So I think a lot of designers are now realizing that the, pow- the power they have in their hands and they push others in the tech community, especially to design more ethical uh, products. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> they have a really... I don't know, maybe it's a stupid question. What's up with all the gradients <laughs> out there now? Is that like, where the fuck did that hey, come easy. from? <laughs> the, the visual design trends, I, I stopped following them okay. because it doesn't really matter. Like, right. like when you're in the, in the industry for a while, you see like something comes and some other things comes up and everybody's like obsessed with it. And then yep. a year well, later, something is We different. went through like, I don't know, 15 years of glossy button yeah yeah oh, yeah. 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 Man, yeah i hated and that flat like, everything's flat <laughs> right? everything's flat yeah with a slight gradient yeah yeah, yeah. we and uh, rounded edges you know and again like apple apple like leads the charge on a lot of these trends right Definitely. you know i mean right. the 
like the curvature of the laptop versus the phone versus the icon right the app are all like identical and I mean the notch. The notch. The on notch the is iPhone, a great yeah. example. So yeah. this year, you know, they came out with the iPhone 10 and it had the notch and it got a lot of flack because it's, you know, whatever. Every other phone manufacturer since has recreated it and replicated it yeah. for a trendy reason. You know, and it's interesting that these um and I think this actually goes back to design in general. So like BMW, their famous thing is the kidney grills in the front of the car, right? That is essentially yep. the notch. Yeah. Even on your Apple Watch, oh yeah, you see the icon of the iPhone 10 yeah, and with the with the notch on it. I yeah. mean, those are the kidney grills, right? Mm-hmm. That you would see on. It's the slightest. And, yeah, 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 and but that's in, like he's saying it's a trigger. Right, mm-hmm. right. But now you're that was industrial design, right? Right, like machine stuff, and now it's being translated from in the actual thing, that physical, tangible object, into the actual software that that icon should represent of that tangible thing. So, so. what you're saying is. Version four of the Apple Watch is now going to have a notch and it's <laughs> away from the two inch screen that I already have. Yeah, <laughs> or they're gonna. I can't wait to see the Apple Watch icon with a notch on it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, oh man, there it is. It always ha- But we got further along this time. Nice. <laughs> um, okay, so um, going back into some of the trends that we were talking about. So Andrew and I are are pretty fascinated, as a lot of people are right now, with um, AR and VR. Uh, and obviously combining that with the power that you're talking about where a designer has, what do you see laying out for the future of those spaces? Because um, it gets pretty scary, but also really awesome. Mm-hmm. Like those technologies, I feel like it's either going to be end of the humanity. <laughs> right. Or it's going <laughs> to be saving grace. You heard it here first. Yeah. This is the last YouTube <laughs> it works video. It's our saving grace, right? Because <laughs> I, like, I, I don't know if you tried VR, but once you get into that world, it's just like you don't really need the real world. Right. Like you Just think about the design. When you go to Facebook, they make you do things, right? With VR, they control the whole experience. Right. They control the vision. They control the sound. They, they're going to control other emotions in the future as well. So in that sense, I'm very, very hesitant about that technology. I think it brings a lot of good things into the table. Uh, but I, I, I have complicated feelings about it. I'm, I'm a little bit scared, to be honest. Interesting. Um, it's also, I, I think it's, an interesting angle too that you talk about the other senses mm-hmm. right because does like when we think of design it's mostly visual, mostly right, visual right. right but now it's like how do you design an experience that's well, I, specific I to touch i, I kind of think i mean i always think about audio design just being you know having the dj background yeah sure whatever. right um yeah i mean because to, to me i always used to say like you could take my eyes, but if you take my ears, I'm gonna kill myself <laughs> because I, I like sound is such an important thing to right. yeah. uh at least to me, um, but sound design plays a huge part in creating right. the experience that he's talking about. Right, right. So there's there's definitely some some design psychology. Cues. Well, no, but now it's like blending yeah, touch exactly. and sight and right, hearing right. and like those those three and whatever other senses maybe you know. Um, but that's an interesting angle, and I never actually thought about it that way. That when you mentioned those other senses that now need to be quote unquote designed for right um it's pretty crazy what you can create now right i mean you can create virtual reality (laughs) exactly yeah yeah (laughs) like the movie ready player one amazing i I think it's it's a great movie and it's spot on and i think it's going to become the reality because i hope so you hope so (laughs) totally yeah so (laughs) i had this fantasy as a kid uh, Uh since i was like like 10 9 or 10 so Back to the Future 2 is my favorite movie of all time. I know fans out there, one is a better movie, I know, but two okay. is the one that like was ingrained in my head. It's yeah. the one, you know, like when you hit that 9, 10 age, it, things are like molded into your brain. Yeah. So Back to the Future 2 is that for me. Um, so in Ready Player One, his car was the DeLorean. Oh, yeah. So I can't wait till I can have that DeLorean, <laughs> my hoverboard, <laughs> like my Nike mags and yeah. whatever else. And it'll be nothing like that. <laughs> it'll probably, it probably won't be, but it's, yeah, it, hopefully by the time uh, by the time I lay my head down. Speaking of DeLoreans, I saw a dude driving down like Sepulveda the other day with... Replica? It was like the replica. It, it could have been the... 
fucking show car from from Back to the Future. He had the garbage thing on the back. Oh, wow. Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah all, awesome. You looked inside. He actually had the uh, the digital like square speedometer like right on the top. The dude had it like down to like every last detail, man. It was so they were pretty like, impressive. Like, I think maybe two years ago they started taking. Uh, they were going like DeLorean, the motor company, actually went out and bought all the old ones that were kind of like laying around because oh, wow. they stopped manufacturing. Yeah. But yeah. now they've turned them into electric versions. Oh, right. So you can buy an awesome. electric DeLorean, nice. which is awesome. I mean, I don't know how efficient it is because that thing weighs a ton. I know, but yeah. it's probably faster than the original it's faster one, than the right? Original. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but it's not a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, all right. Cool. So let's dive into. Um, food people Mm -hmm. i'm really intrigued about it and obviously the (laughs) entrepreneurial side of um what we do on the podcast and just andrew and myself um it's just it's really intriguing like your your business model for it but the concept behind it so and i actually want to start i want to ask you also like how you're tying all these other you know parts of your your former career into it to kind of drive it yeah so food people is basically on-demand chefs. And what that means is whenever you are having a dinner party, inviting friends over or have a birthday celebration, you would be able to order chefs through uh, a website on food people. And it's think it like Airbnb experiences for chefs. <clears throat> uh, so the reason why I started this company is basically a, a few th- different things. Um, the biggest reason I think uh, I spent pretty much my whole life in front of computers. That was my job. I designed website and so on. And as I get older, I have these memories coming from the past. Like we would have dinner parties with our family. We would all do the shopping, go into the kitchen, cook everything, have those like uh, connections with the family, right? So I realized like uh, I'm, I'm the only one in the U.S., in my family so i don't have that kind of experience anymore mm-hmm. and i think about those past <clears throat> moments excuse me and i think about my life in front of the computer i'm not regretting it but i i said i want to do something different my, in, with my life i want to be outside more i want to go see different places i want to meet with other pl- people and i want to create experiences in real life which is like sh- create experiences with chefs right i also uh Working in tech for about 10 years and five years earlier doing other things, uh, working for other people after a while, if you like to own things, if you want to control the experience, it's you want something more. I'm, I'm one of those people. So I wanted to. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I wanted to create something. I wanted to control not control, but affect the company culture, affect the business model, affect the product more than I could I could ever do by working As an employee, for the company. Right. Exactly. So uh, my goal with this company, like I, I had this itch to start a company for a while, but I my biggest goal with this company is to build a team, a small team that can achieve a lot of things. But at the same time, like uh, we are socially responsible. We care about our chefs, we care about our clients, we care about our employees, we empower them. We don't make them work long hours. It's, it's all about having that work-life balance and having uh, equality in the company, having a diverse team. So I have a model that I'm still working on in my mind, but my uh, thinking is if I am able to create these small teams, do you guys familiar with the Google Design Sprint? Yeah, which is basically a five-day uh, plan where a t- small team comes together and they have an idea and they create a design, a prototype for this design, and they test it and then val- validate the idea. So I, I'm trying to create a similar model that works in long term in a company. And imagine uh, we started with dinner parties, personal chefs, but imagine that team created that product. And then we expand our focus into different areas in the food service business and hire more people, make these smaller teams, and then expand from there. Dude, that's awesome. Um, I, you know, we we obviously work together and we were around the office together, but I never knew that that was a part of. So you actually are starting. Most people talk about their product, right? Right, but you're actually starting with the culture of it. You're built the culture of the company ends up becoming your product. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I think huh. it's it's a 
it's a smart way to um to scale that type of business because yeah. the you can't consider the end product just the chef and what turns out on the dinner table, right? Because that can be that can theoretically be replicated by but the experience can't be, right? So creating the culture first makes it scalable in a different way. So what what do you think are your challenges? Because for and I'm actually asking from a, being a business owner myself, um, creating culture to me is the most difficult thing. To be honest with you, because there's a lot more there's a lot of things that you can't control. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, how you hire or whatever, but you can't control how people are. Mm-hmm. They yeah. are they are who they are. So it's about finding people who align with that culture from the beginning. So for you, how are you finding, how are you building these teams or how are you going about building these teams? Well, to be honest, I'm in the beginning of this everything. First, I need to figure out my company a little bit more, understand the business side of things a little bit, have a little bit more confidence. Uh, But my thinking is I I, I try to be a fair person in my life, in my relationship. I try to, uh, all those things I told you, I try to apply those into my life. And my thinking is, if I continue doing this, if I surround myself with people like these, I will be able to find talents easier than uh, going out there and interviewing like 100 people. Uh, but yeah. that's just an assumption. Uh, I, I have little knowledge about hiring. I have some friends, hopefully will help me with that. But it's, it's a part of the challenge. And um, I think it's getting a little bit easier to uh, hire for companies in that sense, in the way I'm thinking. From a culture standpoint. Definitely. Yeah. standpoint yeah, totally. Because yeah. uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but so the, when you think about the Silicon Valley, you think about these unicorns, right? Like Facebook is a unicorn. Google is a unicorn. They destroy the whatever industry and disrupt it. And they are number one. So there's a lot of, there's, big culture like that but there's a uh, a culture that is against it which is called a zebra culture yep. and zebra, they say zebra is zebra is fixed the things unicorns break right so yep. in that uh, culture basically you're focusing on like people instead of making money so that's my approach I'm following that uh, it's, it's, it's a user group basically you can mm-hmm. sign up as well and I'm following their lead pretty much that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm actually glad you brought that up because I've recently learned about this sort of counterculture mm-hmm. that and I I do feel like it's funny Google's like MO was like for the longest time don't be evil, yep. right? And yep. dude, when you get to a certain point in a in terms of revenue and shareholders and people you got to be responsible to, you actually kind of have to become evil in some way yeah. shape or form, right? <clears throat> Facebook is dealing with that exact issue right now. Right, they were evil from day one. So, <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> um, but, but I, but I, but I think that part of the tech tech has gotten a lot of attention because of the amount of wealth mm-hmm. that it's that's been created in it. Yep. But I also think that a, generating a certain amount of wealth also creates a certain type of culture. Exactly. Right. Oh, what? Well, sorry to cut you off. Um. We should have a run of those clips. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I know what you're kind of getting to, but there's like with that wealth of, you know, Google's also known for culture wise, like, oh, we throw these awesome parties, you know, like we have this huge campus, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, it's almost like a mask over top of some of the underlying yeah. problems. A lot of Hollywood stu- like visual effects studios actually do this same thing where they pretend like everything is great because they're making you work 20 hours a day, you know, and we're like, Oh, we're not going to pay you overtime, but you know what? There's a ping pong table on yeah. the back and do you, free beer. Do like, you know, uh, do you know what Soylent is? Soylent? Soylent? It's, it's a drink, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like a, it's like, it's basically like muscle milk, yep. right? Okay. It's like a meal. Like a sugary. Yeah. It's like a meal replacement basically. Um, so, yeah. It's a supplement. It's a supplement, right? But the reason why Soylent was created, it was created by a bunch of Silicon Valley people because they wanted to work through the night without having to eat. Oh. And when I, and which is the exact opposite of what like, you know, eating yeah. is like eating, eating is a big sleeping. communal thing. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's about bringing people together and, exactly. you know, sharing culture and just shared experience. And I, I guess like the reason I brought up the Soylent thing was like, that is the epitome of like the this this counterculture against mm-hmm. Silicon Valley, right? Which is just keep your head down, 
fucking code all day long the more you ship the more the more worthy you are like all that stuff and it's kind of sad because i think when i was in when i was i graduated from college in 2006 and a lot of the jobs that people were looking for at the time were finance jobs this was before the whole financial crisis if you wanted to make money you go to wall street you make a shitload of money yeah you become a wall street person Wolf but wall street, yeah yeah exactly right but that we'll all like those stereo- into that, right? but dude all those stereotypes were like really true yeah. and at the, a bunch of coke and yeah well back then it was like but then the the people who did who wanted to like do something with their life they wanted to and but they still wanted to make money right they went into engineering or cs and they went to go work for the tech companies before they became the massive companies mm-hmm. they are today and yep. i think people have actually technology on so in silicon valley has kind of turned the way of finance on wall street mm-hmm. do you know what i mean yeah. um a lot of these stereotypes are out there and i hate to say it but stereotypes are there for a reason yeah do you know what i mean the, and again not to bring up apple again the uh the, but yeah led by apple like um, you know, the Steve Jobs method, like just beat everybody until they get yeah, what you want yeah. out of them. Yeah. You know, and then the, like, there's the tech bro and right. like, oh, you know what I mean? Like I just got my newly minted Ferrari because I just sold my shares and because we got funded by Series B or Series C yeah. or whatever. But it's cool to hear that like um, the the mission, there, there's a true mission for the company, yeah. right? And that actually lent line goes back to kind of the the recruiting of the company and actually building the company, the the people become the product, essentially, right? Um, that's cool, man. Um, so let me ask you, like, what was the scariest thing? Like jumping off, like deciding, or what what was that inflection point to say, you know what, I'm I'm gonna fucking focus on this. I'm gonna take the risk because I think we all have our own little story about how we did that. But what was your story? Um, so my story is I escaped Silicon Valley twice. Um, <laughs> wait, it wasn't wait, that bad the first time? Wait, what was the second time? This is the second time. Okay. Yeah. So the first time I basically worked for a company for about four and a half years. I, I learned a lot. It was a great company, but I felt like it wasn't going anywhere. And I, I, from 2008 till that company, I saw the change in Silicon Valley, like San Francisco. When I was there, like we had like friends, like teachers, people, local people and all those things. Everything was a lot cheaper, still expensive. But I've seen the change, how tech people came and it changed, re-changed everything basically. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the city itself like is San, San Francisco is. It's, it's crazy right now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the kind of social issues that are kind of going on there with the homeless and the drug problems and exactly. people getting priced out. Like you can't live there anymore unless you make. Three hundred thousand dollars a year, or whatever exactly. that case is, right? Yeah, as, everybody as, to Oakland, but now they're trying to. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> as techie as we think we make the world a better place, but we take a dump in the place we live. Right. So, anyways, uh, after that, I wanted. This was my first time in the U.S. I only see in San Francisco, so I wanted something different. I still wanted to do design, but I didn't want to be in San Francisco that much. So I put everything into my bag came to Los Angeles and got a job here, still in tech. I spent a couple of years here, but uh, that company didn't work out very well. So what I did was I started, I, my, I put my mind into doing freelance design. Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to travel the world. I put everything into storage and I got this client from San Francisco, early stage startup. And uh, they basically say we start working together as a contractor. And eventually it got to a point where like, oh, we're going to raise Series A and we will need a design team. Do you want to build it? So that pulled me back to San Francisco. Got it. And uh, yeah, after that, I spent a a couple of years over there and then escaped to some uh, before escaping to San Francisco. Actually, I bought a one-way ticket to Singapore and I wanted to go travel a little bit with no plans. So nice. I did the Southeast Asia tour and ended up with South Korea. And during that two and a half months, I was basically thinking about what am I going to do when I go back? Uh, what I need, what I want from this life? I, I was always thinking about like starting a company, but I didn't know what it was because yep. the idea is also important, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> a little bit. Everyone yeah. me a little you bit. You don't want to have another t-shirt company? <laughs> 
So yeah, I, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, but I was also w- like not really working. So I wanted to work. So I came back and I got to Unitar. I was doing freelance work and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, but I was already sold. Like after that company, I, I didn't want to work for someone else. So I just said, okay, this is what it's going to take. I'm going to work long hours doing freelance, supporting myself, and also going to start a company. And I stumbled upon this idea, and here I am. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. When so, uh, what would you say was the official? I started this company. Like when you started the LLC, uh-huh. you built a landing page, whatever. Yeah, I, I think it was mostly the idea phase. Like I, I was poking into this idea of personal chefs. I was learning about their lives. I started interviewing some personal chefs, and I realized like like chefs are basically like culinary designers, right? right, right. It's, it's that's a cool they, way to think about it, right? They design these food experiences. I designed these websites. I felt like there was an opportunity, and that was the towards the end of last year. That's cool. cool. Yeah. Um, all right. L- one last question. How'd you get into sure. photography? <laughs> photography. Oh man. <laughs> we will link you. I want to link your, your Instagram cause you, you, <laughs> you do take amazing photos and Thank we're, you. we're actually running out of time, but I wanted yeah. to touch on that. Uh, photography is another, like as a kid, I was one of those kids. Like I want to try this thing. I want to do this thing. I want to be a basketball player. I want to learn karate and all those things. So photography was one of those things. My mom thinks, uh, thanks for her buying me my first camera semi-manual nice. and I, that's I sh- started shooting my friends and that was towards the end of high school uh, but I had like this love-hate relationship with photography because all the first photos I took were basically shit <laughs> and I hated them so I, I'm not going to be a photographer anymore and then a couple of years later I would buy a new camera yeah. and get back to it you were hooked. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You sucked at the beginning, but yeah. you uh, you still came back. So yep. probably no, that, a sign you're passionate that's, about that's it. That's a cool creative outlet to at least yeah. always go to. Um, we'll definitely link up your Instagram in, in awesome. the show notes because yeah, you take you take amazing pictures. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, we're out of time. The music kicked on. Yeah, I know. Really, so, uh, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much for Thank being you. on, man. This Thank was awesome. Having man. Me. Yeah, that's a great information. Learned a little bit more about you, actually. Yeah, yeah. I already. already so I'll cool. see you guys next week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, guys. We'll link everything in the show notes. Thanks again for tuning in to the Run with Toby podcast. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, check us out, and tell a friend about our podcast. We will see you on the next one.